lockdown and it is uh, a new podcast. We've got three legends of surfing in South Africa. I, I called them in a, a warm up to this South Africa's momentum generation. But uh, like I said to the boys, just before we start again, a big uh, sort of shout out to the Engelbeck family on the South Coast, Llewellyn Engelbeck, little under 12 surfer dying yesterday, uh, Thursday, uh, although you'll listen to this podcast on a Monday. And uh, just really sad to see a, a young surfer who was so full of life and so keen on surfing being taken from us. So we dedicate the show today to to Llewellyn and just a, I think a reminder for everyone guys that you know you've got to appreciate every day and that uh, don't take don't take anything for granted yeah. so um, going it, forward it goes on there. yeah yeah so there you go Beister is in the house all the way from Australia and we're going to chat to him of course uh, part of the Ripcoll search crew back in the day with Frankie and Tom Curran. Also joining us, ex-CT surfer, now heading up O'Neill and Volcom in South Africa, Paul Canning. How's it, Canna? Yeah. <laughs> you can see the range in the background there. And then, of course, wow, also... <laughs> <laughs> and then joining us as well, ex-CT surfer, the longest lasting of the South Africans on the championship to Mr. Greg, the Bigfoot Emsley. How's it, Greg? How's it, Kai? How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. Thank you. So I thought you guys were a generation that uh, really sort of put South African professional surfing on the map, whether it be free surfing or contest surfing. And it's nice that we've got the blend here on the show. Obviously, most of the podcast starts with lockdown, corona lockdown, and a bit of a split here because here in South Africa, we're still not surfing, although we've been told that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Baista, you guys have kind of already been through this whole process. You've had lockdown and the beaches reopened. And of course, you work on the beaches where you live. You're a part of the, the health and safety aspect down there. Tell us about what's been going down in Australia. Yeah, fully. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm very stoked, especially with these two legends. I uh, grew up with them. I can't remember surfing without these two guys. Um, and I uh, just want to say that I think the three of us got to experience a hell of a big scene in South African surfing because we were, I think, part of the first sort of competitive surfers back in the international playground um, coming through the ranks, just obviously you know, being born in the 75, 76, 77 era. Um, so, yeah, just an absolute honour to be here, Kai, and to be with Foot and Paul, who haven't aged a day. Um, it's really cool. It's also really cool to see Paul pushing his job in the background there, thanks to Greeny, selling the range. Good stuff. Happy days. But, um, yeah, Kai, just, just, to, just to say, like, we've all been going through this lockdown stuff around the world together. Um, in, in Australia, obviously, we're a little bit for Today is actually the first day in, in the state, I live in New South Wales, that they've actually uh, relaxed the laws. So I'm actually at my father-in-law's place for the first time in two months, having a family dinner, which is really nice to come out of that. Uh, really cool. Um, I am a lifeguard, a professional lifeguard, so I'm really lucky I've been on the beach every day through the whole coronavirus thing. Um, and, yeah, the beaches here have have only the only beaches that have been in lockdown here are the main beaches where they can't control the numbers and so we have been really really lucky in the way that we've been allowed to surf and exercise surfing obviously you get you're getting manly and bondi and the gold coast certain beaches that are shut down um but yeah we have been allowed out to exercise every day for an hour um and obviously we're um uh, the beaches have been open, so surfing's been open, but it's been really weird. It's been, you're going down to the beach, people are staying, keeping a distance. You're seeing part of the beaches that are populated that people didn't used to go to in the past. Um, I work in a particular beach just outside of Newcastle, and there's a beach called Nine Mile Beach, which is sort of for four by fours only. And at the moment, you're seeing people walking down the paths and utilizing those parts of the beaches. So they really are following the rules they really are um you know uh, social distancing's in play 
And the government over here has also adopted a philosophy instead of locking people up and arresting people, which, you know, in some areas has to be done, obviously, to control this. They've decided fining people is a lot better thing to do with the same result. So you do get are sort of hefty wafting fines um, that, that are rolling around. But yeah, but generally surfing's been open for, for recreational use and exercise. And, um, and, and today's the first day that, that the lockdown laws are sort of uh, relaxing and we're coming out of that. So it's really nice to see. My heart goes out to, to everybody in the developing nations. Um, it's gonna be a lot longer process. Um, obviously there's other, there's variable factors, you know, across the board that af affect all that. And, and it is really heartbreaking to see you guys not being able to access the ocean, um, not only from a, a, an exercise point of view, but from a family point of view, but also for mental health sort of point of view, it, it, it really does affect everybody across the board. So yeah, my heart goes out to everybody in South Africa who can't get in the water and let's hope they change those those decisions as, as quick as possible, yeah. Now, Greg, um, obviously today at, at 3 p.m. Friday, uh, I've got Robin from Surfing South Africa and Colin Fitch from WSL uh, talking about a lot of this stuff. And uh, you're, you're also obviously very involved as a board member of Surfing South Africa. You've been coaching the junior team, uh, going to Worlds. Uh, how's it been for you in East London on lockdown and kind of what is your feeling on what's going to happen next in, in surfing in South Africa? Um, well, Kyle, that's, yeah, that's a, that's an, an interesting question because first of all, I think I've been, I think Robin's hating me at the moment because I've been really bugging him with this, um, lockdown story. And of course I, I try and get in the water every day. So, Obviously, it's, it's um, you know, it's affected me and I would love to be back in the water, but laws are laws. So, um, I've been sort of trying to push Robin to to get as much out there as possible. And they've done a great job with that, um, with that recent application. It's really thorough. It's a good read. And uh, let's hope government look at it. And um, it's not only about, obviously, us surfing, but there's a lot of jobs around surfing. You see Paul's in the office, which is good. Hopefully, they can start selling clothes again. Um, we see the coaches, um, guys like you, commentators. Hopefully, you, you know everyone can get um, some sort of work going. I mean, obviously, we don't foresee it until probably towards the end of the year. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be quiet right until till summer. I don't think anything can happen until then. And um, but well done to Surfing South Africa for putting that application in. I think it shows that they've got the surfers at heart. But at the same time, we've got, we have to follow um, the laws of the land. And um, it, it, it is heartbreaking not to be, be able to get in the ocean. For me, the biggest thing is not having a date. Where we saw France, they said, for instance, that they would get back in on the 1st of, of June. And then they've moved that forward. And I think they're already back in the water. So if we had a sort of a date where it was, say, for instance, the 1st of June, you could, you could plan for that and go, okay, well, I'm going to do, do a bit of work here and I'm going to do this. And and get ready to surf all day on the 1st of June. But I think not knowing is, um, is a bit tough for, for a lot of people. They, they're not sure, will our government even look at that application? Do they even know what surfing is? Um, it's all these things that, that are going through people's minds and wondering when, when is there gonna be light at the end of the tunnel and, and when are we gonna surf again? And um, I've done about 150 Ks of running and cycling since um, level four. And uh, on my route, I go past Nahoon Reef, and every single day it's been absolutely firing. So I um, oh. sort of do my exercises around there, um, checking out the waves. And, and, and you know, it is, it is still a bonus to be able to at least watch waves and mind surf. But on, on the way, I get to see the groms that are all really pale in the face from not being in the water. And um, they all look at me like in desperation, like, what news do you have for me? When are we going to be in the water and I've sort of got to go to the other, other side of the road and just keep on jogging because I've, I've got no news for them. Like everyone else, we've got no idea when we'll be back in the water. And, and that's heartbreaking for me. It's not, not only myself uh, being able to be in the water, but really seeing those crumbs dying to get back in and they just want some answers. 
Well, and it's interesting, Greg says, you know, he talks about the industry of surfing. It's a, a big talking point with Robin and Colin. And seeing surfers like the young QS guys like Aidan Mason camp posting, you know, like, when can I get back to work? Because, you know, um, Matty McGillivray is luckily enough for him in Australia in, on the Gold Coast. He's been able to surf. But we've got Geordie Smith back in country, Mikey February, Beric de Vries, all these guys. And they're literally losing ground, Paul, because not only are they unable to train because they can't surf, the problem is, is as you know, as a, a brand manager, is they're losing ground content-wise, which is so important these days because I'm seeing content dropping from Australia, Europe, America, Hawaii. These guys are staying fresh in the eye of the consumer, literally, keeping their sponsors fresh in the eye of the consumer. And it's quite a tricky situation in that we talk about recreational surfing, but there's a bigger problem at play here for the professional surfers. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a, a massive issue, you know. Um, I think it's also, it's, it's our best time of the year, you know. It's the time of the year when we score all our best waves, you know, April, May, June now. Um, you know, we, we've been to Urban, I know we've been having land breezes every single morning. It's been every okay. day this week three and six foot every day, you know. I think it's one of the best Mays I can remember in a, in a long time. And I think that's what's making everyone so desperate, you know. You have a day of onshore or, or a big, you know, west where, where, you know, you're not really checking the coast much. Obviously, that's all right for town. But um, uh, that, uh, you, you know, you, you, it doesn't really affect you too much. But when you go down there and you check uh, the northern beaches or, the, or down the south coast and uh, it's perfect land breeze and, and it's just firing, you know, these guys can be getting such good content. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's what's making it so much more difficult, you know. And, um, and also, I mean, the amount of events that these guys are losing out on, you know, that's how they make their, their money and, and they put their name out there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously... With us not being able to invoice a cent in all of April and, and half of May, you know, at, at the end of the day, the, the money that comes in generates the, the marketing budget that you can that you can then give onto the team riders and, and the athletes and, and, and pump into marketing. So if there's no money coming in, it's, it's, it's hard to you know stay afloat and, and give the money out, you know. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's a major problem, but um, I think I'm hoping we could the worst of it you know um personally i i, I just try and uh, i just try to block it out you know since since i retired and it's been pretty flat out working and and uh, finally got a month to just actually spend at home and uh, spend time really good quality time with the family and um and a lot of things that we have never had the chance to do like you know my wife's spanish and we've never got to really teach the kids spanish we always talk english at home we've had some intensive spanish lessons and uh yeah and just just uh you know the first couple of weeks were quite cool spending family time picking up the house but i think the last uh the last few weeks are starting to get a little bit uh empty when they allowed us to come back into the office when they move to level four and uh, start selling our winter clothing like jackets and sleeps and that it was actually quite nice getting out the house and coming into the office a few days of the week you know so um yeah so do we i think we just we but the big question now is, is, as Greg says, if we can just put a date on it, you know, everyone's wanting to know, like, if we can just have a set date when when, it's, when we can get back in the water. But I look at it from different aspects. I don't know what are they, maybe they're waiting for the, um, for the uh, shark sport to be able to put the nets in, you know. Are they going to do anything until the nets are, are back in? Even though most of the beaches we surf, you know, on, on the north coast and south coast don't have nets. Maybe they're waiting for the nets to go back and then the lifeguards to go back to the beaches. Then they'll open. Just no one really knows what sort of criteria they, they, they're looking at. You know? Well, I've got to say, I think just leave those nets out. That's, that's my input on that one. I think we've had <laughs> off without them and so nature. But um, I do, do say well done to the Sharks board. I know a lot of guys who work there and, and they do do hard work and, and good work. Hopefully we can, even if they take the nets away, they can just put them onto sort of marine patrol or something like that, stop all the poaching. But um, let's go back in time, away from lockdown. And, of course, we were saying, Buster's waving his hands there. What do you want to tune? I just wanted to, I just want to know, PC, all the Spanish lessons and everything. Are we going to get another junior little baby PC coming out of this time frame or what? Yeah. Well, I got two already, Buster. <laughs> yeah, but there's so much passion and, and uh, you know, yeah. you, sound, you had me going there, bro. 
All right, we'll, 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 we'll find out on that later. So let's go back in time. Uh, and and we'll, Baster, I mean, chat to us. I mean, we, I, I call you guys the South African momentum generation. And there were a few other surfers involved. You know, it was your guys' kind of generation that set that platform for the next group, which was sort of Travis and Geordie and, and Ricky and that, and that crew. What was it like being that first crew of, of really talented South African surfers who were allowed to suddenly engage with the world? And, and I mean, in your case, you got to go travel to like the most amazing destinations with Tom and Frankie on the search. It must have been an incredible yeah. time. Well, it was, it was really incredible. And the funniest thing is these two boys here sitting in the chat with me, we all went through it together. I mean, PC was a year above me and Greg and I were in the same sort of year. And um, we, we all went through this whole uh, sort of similar challenges to maybe what's going to come up now in terms of sponsorship and being able to leave your home. I mean, back then we were all paying for our boards. You know, if we got half price on our wetsuits, we were stoked. And, you know, maybe if we got a few items of clothing from Gotcha or Billabong or Quicksilver or whatever, you know. Um, so it really is sort of starting up again. Um, as juniors, you know, Greg was probably my sort of in the same age group. We, we did the Bali, the Brazil, the Bali thing together. I think I got second in the world. Greg won it the next year. And, and at that point, um, Greg and Paul went on to qualify and did amazingly, amazingly well on the on the QS and the CT. For me personally, I got to a point where I probably surfed 30, 35 weekends out of the month I was at events. By the time I was 18, 19, I, I kind of was a little bit, a little bit, I don't know, confused. And I got went on the free surfing thing and, and that was amazing. And I got created my own identity on that. And, and Paul and Greg were the first African surfers to qualify on the CT. And I think through that whole, that, that experience, everything that we did was just so groundbreaking and beautiful. I mean, Paul went over to Europe and absolutely killed it and met his beautiful wife and, and, and developed this amazing career. And, you know, Greg had that longevity on the, on the, on the tour where he was, you know, taking down the biggest names, making finals in France and, you know, Joan killing at J-Bay before he even got on the tour. And it, it was really cool. It was a really, really good thing. And there's so many guys. There's so many guys that ripped at that age. I mean, you know, if you just went down to the New Pier uh, or you paddled out at Nahoon Reef or you went out at Long Beach like, or J-Bay, I mean, you just, you couldn't even, there was 20, 30 guys back then that were just amazing. And we had guys ahead of us like Mark Roscoe, Frankie, Gordon Turnbull, Greg Hasty, Seth Hulley, you know, all those sort of guys, Jason Ribbink, uh, Wayne Monk, amazing, amazing surfers that just were a little bit late and didn't have the opportunity that we had. And I think the thing that, that made it work for us is we, we came from nothing. We didn't have any money. We just wanted to surf. We were hungry. I mean, the two guys on screen with me right now are probably the hungriest competitors you could ever have. You know, having them in heats. You know, I had their number maybe when I was younger, but we got to the stage where I couldn't beat these boys, no way, you know. And guys like, you know, learned off them on tour, you know. Um, Chris Ward, Corey Lopez, um, all those court kind of guys that these guys were beating back in their day, they all had the big dollar sponsorships. They had the movie parts. They had everything going for them. But we were just hungry and we loved surfing and we had it bloody good time you know and also the differences was i think when we went away unless we wrote a postcard or found a call box and had reverse charges home no one knew, knew where we were it was up to us to make it happen yeah boys uh, you know just you know it was beautiful and we didn't have surf forecasting or it was how on sure you got out there you surfed you surfed your brains out you know so it was a really special time, Kai. It was. It really was. And I'm so blessed to have grown up with these boys and had them in my life, and 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 we were able to make careers out of it. And I think the careers we made out of that time frame in surfing set up the rest of our lives. Like, look what Greg's doing with surfing South Africa. Look at the junior talent coming out of East London. PC is running the surf industry with Greeny down in Derbs. You know, it's 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 it really did and. Yeah, we were very, very lucky and very, very humble 
at the time, I think. So, yeah. Well, and it's interesting because, I mean, I'm the same age as you guys, really. I'm 77. So, you know, I grew up watching you guys in my age group, essentially. And, I mean, with Paul and Greg, like, my peers being the first South Africans to really do the championship tour. And, I mean, Paul, it must have been, I mean, it must have been kind of terrifying being that first sort of guy taking that step up and, and going, wow, I've actually, I've actually made the championship tour. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was awesome. But just to jump back there, what Buster said, just to go back a few years earlier, you know, it was quite classic. You know, we, we, when I first started surfing at eight, and, and then Byron, I think, had already started surfing a, a little bit before me, and, and I came into KZM surfing and trials on it. For those early years, you know, up, up until about 15, I think, Buster was impossible to beat. He, he was by far the best surfer in, in, uh, in, in South Africa, you know, in my opinion, you know. And, uh, you know, he was just a little ripper. He had such a good little style too, like a little, like a hockey, sort of young hockey style, you know. And um, we were growing up, you know, through those years, 11, 12, 13. And, and uh, I was always back around, you know, maybe fourth or fifth in the country. You know, there's Byron was up there, Craig Elf was up there, Jevin was up there, Jevin LaRue, Michael Moore was, was one of the good guys. And I remember my, you know, what, what really turned it for me is um, it was kind of a second. Generation, where that era when we were started allowed to travel again, and we were, it was the first year back to the um, to the, the ISA World Games, you know. And they said, okay, we're going to be sending a South African team, you know. And I, I was like 15 at the time, I think, and I just thought I have to make this team, but they were only going to take four. And I really had these guys. I think, yeah, well, Byron's going to make it, you know. Jevons in there, Craig Ellis is in there, and Dale Bamford was another one that was really good, and I just like it meant everything to me, and it was kind of like the make all or break all, you know. Yeah, and I, I just was training so hard for like two months. Like I just, I was, the trials were going to be down in J Bay, I think they were at Kitchen Windows, I think, and uh, just training in a full suit and, and just surfing my heart out, and and really started to do a lot of swimming and running and everything, and uh, I ended up making the team. And uh, and at that stage, you know, they weren't many. We used to tape a couple of waves on the news and, and see what the, oh, the pros overseas were doing. So there wasn't much we were seeing from overseas. And finally, we'd made the team, got our South African colours, and we were off to France. I think it was in 92. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I know Byron probably feel the same. We were like, we didn't know what to expect, you know. We, we saw these names that we were going to be competing against, like Chris Davidson, Nathan Webster, Nick Lowe. But we'd never really... Seen these guys before, and, and we both. I think Byron got fifth that in that event, and I got seventh out of had a lot of kids from all over the world. And I think that's what really when it dawned on us that hey, maybe we can be pro surfers. You know, maybe in two years' time when we're out of school, maybe we can go and travel and and uh, and uh, get out there and, and try and be a pro surfer. You know, so that that was the very early days. You know, when I very you know first met Buster, and uh, those, those are amazing memories. Well, I mean, Greg, we uh, talk about uh, the hunger for competing. You are still hungry. I mean, you are regularly winning open titles in South Africa, and you love giving it to the youngsters. But, I mean, that hunger He's came from, from your generation. <laughs> I mean, it came from, I mean, Buster mentioned Wayne Monk. I mean, he's still going crazy in the lineup and heats. So, and this is something that I'd really like to see more of is I want to see the youngsters having to surf against you guys because you are the guys with the experience you can teach them. For sure. And I mean, some of the names that have been mentioned here, it's just, I mean, we, we were animals back in the day. We, I mean, we competed hard. We had a good time. We surfed our brains out. It wasn't about let's surf and then let's, let's chill, you know. There was no chilling. We just surfed all day. All we wanted to do was surf. It wasn't, it wasn't about the money because there wasn't much of it out there. And um, so, so we, we just did it because we really... If you if you could get free boards or free wetsuits, as Byron mentioned, you were killing it. And um, yeah, back to that, I was a bit of a sort of a late um, bloomer, I guess, being sort of out at Queensbury Bay, mostly surfing there. I didn't quite know what was going going on in the surfing world. So when I sort of started, um, sort of Byron and Sean Holmes and them used to um, kick my ass pretty badly. And um, but you know, I had to watch it and sort of figure it all out, you know, until um, eventually uh, getting to about 
under 16 started doing a bit better and then under 18 started finding my groove in, in competition and stuff and um and as byron mentioned at that stage i mean he had killed us all up until then and uh, had served so many events was in the spotlight and then uh, he, uh, frankie and him got the dream of of becoming free surfers and it was something at that stage we no one had really done or even thought about so it was quite um, confusing for a lot of us because like, isn't that maybe a path we should be following or you know do we go on to be pro surfers so it was all these all these new roads we could take and it was um i mean we were in awe of, of what they were doing in those waves they were surfing but at the same time we we always wanted to be pro surfers and um so obviously myself and and paul sort of stuck on, on that route and um worked hard at it but yeah i think what what we got um out of our generation and we, what we learned from from the hardcore guys that came before us and, and showed us the ropes um uh, we we took a lot out of it and, and still today when we compete um, we, we've still got it and you see I mean there's so many names even Banksy that we haven't even mentioned and Banksy <laughs> about Greg, Greg and um, you, you know when, when I got on tour there were, the guys were Carl Rue. we just Carl Rue you know and when I got on tour the, it, it was tough we're not I mean when I say tough it was the best times we were piling five guys into uh, freaking a grade rent a car which was two doors or something and um <laughs> and the guys would, would would bring you in and there was seth halley and paul canning and uh, dale bamford was there and byron and and even frankie did a few events and um, jacko, and, Roscoe. jacko and, oh, and, yeah, and we, we just <laughs> and we just uh, try to make heats and, and try to get a bit of cash because you got paid dollars back then and if you got two or three or four hundred dollars you you could get to the next event and you're stoked <laughs> do you remember uh herbie dave well herbie helped us out heaps those couple of years in europe and robin and and um all the crew put together and he came over and he helped us there was so many of us there were so many south africans that he just couldn't organize it all he tried his hardest but we were just there's so <laughs> many of us and Herbie yeah. was trying, and, and Robin and Ariane is just too many. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine him with steam coming out his ears with a bunch of frothing South African grubs invading him in Europe. But I think that was a, a big point of the whole thing, uh, Greg, was that um, because it was that first sort of opportunity for, for South African surfers, there was a pack of you guys. And... People always used to talk about the Brazilian storm. I think that was the original Safa storm back then. Look, we, there were a lot of us. I mean, there were way more than what there is today. And, and, and some guys, you know, you could make it happen. You, know, you, go, to, you, you go to Europe and you could, you could stay in a camper van in the forest and, and you could do 10 or 12 events in a row and, and you, could, you, you would get by. And if you didn't make money in that contest, your mate might have made some money and he would help you along, and um, it was it was proper legs. So you could, even though you had n not much, you could get there and, and and just get to the money round and get and, and get to the next event quite comfortably. And I think that was what was cool about those days is um, being able to do that and actually tour. And Europe was a was a solid what three or four months. So you would just be you would have one car for three or four months between five five of you or whatever sleep on the beach, sleep in a tent, whatever you had to do. Slept, a lot of us slept with Herbie in France in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded bad, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 was, it, was, it was really good days, yeah, good old days. I, I still think back to the tour days and, and my most memorable year was my first year on tour because of all the struggles and all the laughs and, and just making it happen. It was. It was really, really good times. Yeah. And Paul, was classic. I mean, it's interesting how the guys talk about, you know, this generation of South African surfers and that they are still so competitive when they compete, when you go to Masters Champs or SA Opens Champs. But what I like about that generation as well is like the moment you're back on the beach, there was that camaraderie. There was that, that, that real sort of hiss amongst that generation. And... You know, when a guy was surfing the heat, there were 20 South Africans on the beach making some noise for him. But when you got each other in a heat, the gloves were off and it was kill or be killed. 
Yeah, no, it was a to it was totally different. I think it was a pretty gnarly generation. You know, I think we, as Greg said, we learned from the guys before us. You know, so um, you know, it, it, I think it was just a generation of so much hunger. You know, and I think you know, at the end of the day, you know, that, that hunger, the, the mindset of hunger is going to be, you know, the fitness or the or the natural talent nine times out of ten. You know, and, and how hungry you are and how. Greg was the most at that. He was the most competitive guy. And I think it was one of the best things to happen to me, uh, you know, when Greg came on the tour. I started about two years before him, and then he came on. I'd already been traveling for about two years. But the first event, I think I really got to know, we were in Newquay, I think, and, and he made it through a few heats, and then he ended up losing. And it was just like, I looked at him, and it was like, it was the, the worst thing that could happen to him. It was like, it, it, it was... I don't know, just, I just saw so much hunger in, in his eyes and, and then I started traveling with him and, you know, Greg was always the first guy up in the morning, up an hour before light. He was uh, always the first guy at the beach and he would always, if everyone surfed for two hours, he'd surf for three hours, you know, and because I was traveling with him, you know, that just rubbed off on me and it was really good for me, you know, and everyone always says, oh, Greg's the luckiest guy. Greg always gets the set. You know, how come Greg paddles there and a set comes in? I, I always used to say to the guys, you know, it's like every play set. The more you practice, the luckier you get. And Greg was the guy that practiced the most, you know, and, and that was good for me. And, um, and uh, yeah, just, uh, I think um, it was a generation of, of really hungry surfers. And I think, uh, and, that, and that's what we all just, you know, strive to each other and push each other and did so well, you know. Well, I, I understand what you're talking about because my first heat <laughs> back at competing at SA Champs in the Masters was at eight to ten foot onshore Nahoon. And who did I have in my heat with Mr. Greg Emsley? And I found myself <laughs> luckily backline in the spot thinking, right, I've got this heat started. Took a ten foot closeout set on the head, didn't see another wave and watched Greg get two eights. <laughs> <laughs> He'll do that to you, bro. Every heat. <laughs> but Greg, it, it is a big thing. Is like, I think a lot of surfers, you know, talk about talent. But if you want to compete on the World Championship Tour, you need to train. You need to be fit. You need to be strong. Totally. And um, I mean, Paul, you know, Paul and I did feed off each other and also the Byron back in the day. But it's not something that I used to say, okay, well, I've got to spend three hours in the water. Or I need to do this. It was never like a, it was never like a program that I had written in a book or, or anything. It was, it was, I wanted to surf, simple as that. I, you know, when, when that sun was coming up, I didn't want to waste a wave that was going to come through competition or not. I just wanted to be on a wave. I want to surf. Um, and I mean, I'm still like that today. I just, you know, it's that, that being in the ocean and, and every wave is different. And, um, you, you know, whether it was in competition or out of competition, that's, that's, that's what I do. I try and spend as much time in the water as possible. And that, that obviously helped me to be a pro surfer. But it's, um, I, I do see kids that, that are surfers and they, they, they so, almost seem to not have that, where they're not that phased if they go surfing or not, you know. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, it's like, if you want to be like a cricketer, like a fast bowler, you, you, that, kid, that, that kid's going to walk around with a cricket ball in his hand all day, you know, and, and he's just going to be addicted to it. And, and that's what, for me, surfing is. It's, a, it's an addiction. I just, I just can't wait to be in the water and just spend time in the water. And, and so being a pro surfer was the best possible job for me because it was never work. It was just something I wanted to do. <laughs> Well, and I mean, it's, it's incredible that your generation were the first guys to, to get that opportunity ready after Sean Thompson. Then by, I mean, you were super competitive as a junior. I mean, you were being touted for the tour, a lot of talk around you in the media. And then suddenly uh, Derek Hind and crew come along and go like, hey, hey dude, uh, how about you put the search sticker on your board and you're going to do something very, very different now. I mean, what, what's going through your well, head at that point? I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story behind it. It was actually a, it was a complete fluke, absolute fluke. I wasn't meant to be there. I was as hungry. I was hungry, if not hungrier than Greg and Paul as a junior, and I, I loved it. I went to Oz for the first time. I was seventeen. I got my ass handed to me 
in the contest over there. There was no QS events. It was a thing called the Australian Championship Circuit. And I went, went over with Roscoe and Turnbull, uh, Lyle Botcher, Clayton Nienaber, Mark Jackson, a couple dudes. And we all went over Adrian Fields. We all went over and um, uh, to compete. And, and I lost every single event. I was meant to go home after a month. And then Derek said to Jeb and Jacko, Mark Jackson and myself, hey guys, why don't you come down to Bell's? and watch Bells. So we went down to Bells and we didn't even stay at the Ripcoil house. We all had subsidiary sponsors. I was writing for, uh, I was writing for Ripcoil, but Jevin was writing for, I think, uh, Billabong and Ripcoil. Jacko was Cookson and I don't know, whatever. It was wetsuit clothing. And we stayed at, not even at the Ripcoil house, at a friend, Timmy Barr's place at Bells Beach. And um, they moved the contest down to Joanna for the day. And we weren't meant to go. The whole Ripcoil team went down. And, and I ended up getting a ride with Jevin, Frankie, myself, and Jacko, with Bari. We went down. We got down. And I'll never forget it. Gary Green was standing there looking at this left down the beach. And I saw it. And I didn't even own a full suit. I had a long arm, short leg, two mil, flat lock steamer down at Bell's Beach in Easter time. I didn't even own a full suit. And there was this left rip bowl. And I remember going surfing and I never got out the water for six hours. It was a left rip bowl, four feet, five feet. And as I surfed through the day, Rob Machado, Kelly Slater, Shane Beshin, Shane Powell, Potts, everyone was paddling out for their heats, free surfing before their heats. And I was just surfing this little left rip bowl. And, you know, and, and, and I was just in my element with all my heroes, just going, are you kidding me? I'm so, that's fucking Robert Shaw. That's Shane Bay. That's fucking, Mom. you know what I mean? And after about six hours in the water, I came in and I was walking up the beach and Derek walked down to me and he goes, you won. And I said, what are you talking about? I won. You got one what? I said, he goes, no, you won. And he goes, what do you mean? He said, no, the whole Ripcord junior team from around the world is here. We're having a free surfing competition today to see you guys on this trip to Indo. And I'm like, what do you mean? I have no idea what you're talking about, bro. I'm freezing. I want to get changed. He goes, no, you got to rock up tomorrow at Bells at this tent and we're announcing you the winner. And you, and, and pretty much the next day, call the owner of Ripcoil. Everyone came around and said, look, you've got a choice. You either go to the World Games with uh, Greg, and I think it was Justin Mush was to Brazil. And uh, Greg had just won the World, World Juniors, I think, that year. I got second the year before the the grommets in Bali, and and um, anyway, so he said to me, "You've got a choice. You can either go surf the world champs, or you can go to two weeks in West Isles with Tom Curran and Shane Powell and Hedgie, and three weeks in Indo with Tom Curran, or you can go back to the competitive route." And I was as hungry as Greg was and as PC was in the juniors, but I'd got to a point in my my life where I was, I was kind of a bit burnt out by the last bit sacrifice i just got my ass handed to me and i was just like here's a new thing and i went with it and that pretty much took me away from that hunger and that desire and that devotion as a kid and i just went on this new journey and that's all it was i never made money i, I was never the a grade surfer i was never where frank was i was the tier below him but for seven years of my life i lived in my board bag i saw the world I experienced new cultures. I got to see great waves. But I never had the longevity or the success of Greg and PC. But at the same time, I think if you look at it in a whole, we all achieved success out of that generation in our own sort of mind space or where we wanted to be. And, um, and that's why, I, you know, when PC qualified, there's a heart of me that, part of my heart that always wanted to qualify. But at the same time, I, I did achieved the success I, I was looking for in surfing and it was just amazing to see South Africa and it was PC and then a couple of years later was Greg and then you know then it was David Weir and David Weir was taking out guys like Machado at Trestles and then there was um and then there was uh Trav Raven. Trav Boston received late 90s then you know then it, it was just it was an amazing it was an amazing run for me so I, I you know super stoked well, I mean, I, I think I speak for most sort of surfers in our generation and the generation below. I think yourself and Frankie inspired plenty South African surfers because before that sort of whole thing took off, I think a lot of us didn't realize that we could travel 
to these exotic destinations and go surf. We didn't think it was possible as South African kids. We always looked at like, if I'm going to go on a holiday, I'm going to Jaba. I want to go surf super tubes. But Paul, it was like, suddenly it was like, whoa, I can go to Indonesia. Like I can go surf these perfect waves. It, it, it was a whole new sort of ball game for us. It was Paul Canning at Chopu. Did you see that shit? <laughs> oh, <geez. Hot> <laughs> so now, as we look forward again, lockdown is uh, gonna come to an end at some point. Uh, surfing hopefully will be back on the menu. Um, and one of the discussions we've been having is uh, with Travis and Jordy, uh, with, with Paul and Colin, with the girls, is where to now for South African surfing? Um, I mean, we're not going to see international contests probably this year if, if we're really upfront about it. And obviously, Paul, that's a big effector for you guys with the Belito Pro being a challenger series. But WSL have also announced that they're now going to look at a new system where we're going to have a more regional sort of uh, lower tier QS where you're going to have sort of your 5,000s down. Uh, which really plays well into to our hands in South Africa because it's going to be easier for South Africans and Africans to get those those slots in the Challenger Series for our for our area, and then um, the Challenger Series is going to be that sort of intermediate platform where you have the guys coming back down off the CT, meeting the guys coming up from the local QSs, and I mean for me, I think this, this is a really good system, Paul. I think it could work, and it, it really plays into our hands as far as what's been happening in South Africa with City Surf Series, the Vans Contest, and then having our Challenger Series with them to Belito Pro. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it seems like there's going to be a big effort and a big push into, uh, you know, pushing the, the regional series side of the sport, you know, and I think, as you say, that's where um, the local guys can make a little bit of money and, uh, and then, and then you know, get, enough, uh, get enough cash to, to get out there and travel. Um, I think, like like Greg said, when 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 we were first starting, it was it was a little bit easier to enter the tour, you know. I think you know um, because there were longer legs, you know, and more smaller events, you know. Like I remember we were going to Europe, and as Greg said, we were there for like you know three four months, and in between the big six stars, QSs, there were a lot of like little two stars and uh, and European events and. Um, where you could make money, you know. So I think, um, you know, if we can get a really good regional series going and, and the kids coming up can, can get enough uh, money together through those events and, and enough points to get onto the Challenger Series, I think it is looking good for South Africa. And Greg, I mean, you're, you're coaching a lot of the new generation. You know, we look at uh, young Zoe Stain from Nahoon. I mean, she's been competing in, in Opens at ISA and on the QS at the age of 15, 16. Where, where do you see our current crop of youngsters coming out of this lockdown and, and what are they going to have to do to, to get to where you guys got to? Well, you know, you look at, at us and I think the big thing that's, that, that, that we've all said is we've spoken about hunger. Um, so I'm hoping this lockdown is going to create more hunger. Of course, it's happening all around the world, but um, not being able to surf... Um, you know, like just hungry to get back in the water and, you know, probably not going to see any events for the rest of the year. So that's going to make the kids hopefully hungry to get competing again. So for me, coming out of lockdown, um, my advice for the kids is to not worry about surfing contests. Maybe look at uh, being a Byron or Frankie for a while and, and do the free surfing thing. Get your techniques down and really focus on on, on working on those weaknesses. If you've got a weakness, just get it like there's no event, so you don't have to be under pressure. Just go and free surf. Um, let your surfing do the talking. Um, and even coaching wise, not don't over coach. Go and spend loads of time in the water, try different equipment, try different stuff, and, and just be super loose, super free. So when you start 2021, if, uh, if everything's settled down by then, um, you, you've, got, you've got some new ammunition. And um, you 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 super loose, super relaxed, and um, and you like a free surfer basically. Well, and it's interesting you say that because Baster, I mean, what you guys got to do on the search was the original sort of content surfing, which is now every day. I mean, we see Wade Goodall dropping his new uh, movie today 
online. Um, even the CT guys and that, like they have to constantly now be uploading uh, photos, video content, social media, Instagram, YouTube. You've got to keep, you know, yourself in the public eye. And literally, yeah. you guys started that trend. I mean, you were literally at the the, the absolute well, I think, start. I think where it's changed now is what happened before social media and digital or well, the digital world because i was involved in the surf industry up until the end of the print world and what happened then in our days is if you were lucky enough to get a sponsor they made you who you were the the brands made you they made the movies they put out the ads nowadays it's up to you and it's up to any individual and what i want to say is that south african surfers have a reputation of natural ability come from great waves beautiful part of the world very unique very spiritual place and that's what they have in their favor and you've got to emphasize those points if you want to just be a great surfer today go out there and be who you are be south african charge hard do what you can but if you want to be a competitive surfer fuck, look at greg Emsley and paul canning and get fucking hungry excuse my french because that's what separates it. You know what I mean? Those guys right here on this chat, they were never meant to. They were never Chris fucking Davidson on Born and Bred at Narrabeen. Sorry, Dave, but Born and Bred at David and the gold screwed up is their ass. They worked their asses off. So it's not, you've got to have natural ability. You've got the platforms that you can use. But go out there and be hungry. Listen to Greg. Listen to PC. Listen to these guys. Be hungry. Be so hungry that you're eating it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you're not hungry, cool. Make your clip. Make your clips. But if you want to make a CT and you want longevity out of your career and you want to do it to retire, be so hungry that you're always hungry and you're hungrier and you're hungrier and you're hungrier. And that's what makes Kelly Slater who he is today. You know. So. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's fantastic advice for the youngsters back in South Africa. And chatting to the photographers, Ian Thurdle and Alan Van Kaysen, you know, the the feeling from both of them was is exactly what you said there. Like, concentrate on what we have back home right now. Forget about international as we come out of this Corona lockdown, because that will come back eventually. But with travel restrictions, it's it's not going to happen. We really need to focus on local right now. We have to go back to the core. Of South African surfing. We have the waves, we have these incredible exotic destinations from the desert on the west coast to the tropics on, on the east and everything in between and um, really really look at sort of making content locally and, and charging local waves, Paul. Yeah, yeah 100%. Totally. Oh, sorry, Michael. Um, no, I was agreeing. I was chilling here. <laughs> And I mean, Paul, obviously, from, from your side, I mean, as a brand manager for two of the biggest surf brands in the world, here in South Africa, Volcom and O'Neill, I mean, that is, I'm sure, what the message is out to your surfers right now. is like, once you can get back in the water, you, you need to start getting some coverage. You need to start sort of getting out there because, unfortunately for them, their competitors over in Oz and, and America have got have had this whole time to put content out. I mean, Jack, you know, we had Jack Robinson on the show and he's been surfing his brains out at North Point and, and, and Margs and the box and he's putting live clips out. So he's staying relevant. Whereas our guys, as much as like someone like Dylan Lightfoot on O'Neill has been doing incredible work in J-Bay on the Let's Feed J-Bay campaign, he, he's not really keeping current with his surfing footage. Yeah, no, totally. And like, uh, like Byron was saying, it, it is much easier now for, um, for for the athletes to get involved in social media, you know, and keep their profile highlighted. Like and we never had that in our day, you know. And really, every surfer now is their own brand, you know, and, and they just promote that their their sponsors while they're promoting themselves, you know. So so it's very easy for the guys to do that. And there, and there's so much such, such a variety of things to do now as a as an an ambassador, you know, whether it's from the pro side or the or the um, free surfer side, but then there's also the environmental angle, there's the humanitarian angle. There's, there's, there's just so much, you know. Then there's you know there's different variations of the sport now, you know, um, with, with sort of retro side really 
he's having having a resurgence and the travel side you know we see um a lot of the, 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 the surfers nowadays you know they they'd rather watch a really cool travel video of somebody exploring some and sort of unknown waves you know in the outer outer regions of of the planet then um then then watching high performance surfing so there's, there's that, that everyone wants to see their own thing so there's such a variety for for any any young good surfer to, to get involved and um and, and make their own content and and become relevant and, and get their name out there all right so i think it's a, a good point to finish on and uh, i think we've given the new generation some some good words of advice there to finish off guys uh greg any any message to all the surfers currently in lockdown any last words no just get those boards waxed and ready um hopefully it's soon uh yeah just yeah just keep um keep saying and at least we're getting closer whether we, whether it's this month or next month or the month after every day is getting slightly closer so keep fit Try and uh, just get out there, get some fresh air, but um, I'll just keep positive and we're gonna be, we will be back in the water sooner or later. Basta from Australia. All I can say is make the most of your situation and right now you, you're creating hunger, you're breeding hunger. You guys might not be out there being able to surf like a lot of the rest of the world, but you're getting hungrier and you want it more and just keep that because things will work out. We will get back to normal. We are going to get through this. We're going to be right. And um, you guys will figure it out. You guys will be in the water soon, hopefully, but that hunger inside you, that's what you need to succeed. And if you want to make it on the world tour this day with 500 qualifying series surfers going for 10 spots every year, get hungry. Look at the Brazilians get super, super, super hungry. Awesome, and then from you, Paul. Yeah, just everyone take care, and uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be back in the ocean soon. Uh, we've still got a few more good months of winter ahead of us. Uh, we'll all get our waves and uh, focus on what you can do now. You know, whatever training you can do now, make sure you, you're doing staying fit, and uh, we'll be back in the ocean soon. All right, well, thanks so much for being on the show, boys. I think a great episode and a lot of advice for the new generation. Uh, I look forward to catching up with all of you again, hopefully soon. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll chat soon again.